Welcome to the Hawkcast with your host, AJ Hawk. Lori Kill Martin joins me. Lori, you're a longtime stand up writer. You just, your second book just came out, a huge success again. Uh, <laughs> so, where are you right now? What are you uh, like? What's your day to day, I guess, look like? It seems like you're doing a little bit of everything. Yeah, I, I write for Conan. So, um, I got to be at work in about an hour and a half. And uh, normally, right now, I'd be getting my kid up but my mom has agreed to take over so i could do this podcast or your your podcast um and uh today i'll go write a bunch of monologue jokes about um (laughs) our president (laughs) and uh whoever's left in his administration as of today and um uh that'll be it for today basically i'm i usually have shows at night but not this week my kid has a report due on new mexico so i'm trying to stay home and make sure he gets it done so how when you when you go into the studio wherever where Conan shoots out in L.A. How long are you there? Do you you have to stay through the taping and everything? When do you finally get home? Um yeah, we start around nine thirty and we stay till seven ish. I think the taping's at four thirty, and then afterwards we have our writers meeting and like prepare stuff for the next day. How many so. writer, How many staff writers are there? I think there's eleven or twelve. And you all sit in there every, like when you go into nine thirty, you all sit around a big table and come up with ideas no um that's the sketch team kind of does that they sort of sit together and i'm part of the monologue team and we we sort of work isolated uh like prisoners in (laughs) our little booths and write jokes separately and then we we get together a couple times a day meet with conan a couple times a day and figure out which jokes you know he likes and what what jokes he kind of likes but wish were better and then we try to we get together and try to improve them so it's almost like you're writing you're filming like an SNL spe- like show every single week. It seems like with how or every single day how your schedule is yeah. set up. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, you know, uh, we have a different kind of pressure in that we we start dealing with the same stories over and over again. The monologue team, and it's hard to come up with a different joke um, with the same sort of without you just falling into the same pitch and rhythm all the time. And then the sketch people have to mount these giant. You know, they have to make little films and they have sets and they have all these sort of things they've got to put together and half the time it gets cut in rehearsal. So they have they have different traumas than we do. <laughs> do you uh, do you write stuff for Conan for his interviews, like little things that he may get be able to get into with the guest that would be funny for him? Not really. Usually that's the segment producer who's who's in charge of that that guest. Sometimes there's a, a a guest that will want to do a comedy piece with Conan and then the writers will suggest ideas and sometimes they pick them and sometimes they don't. (laughs) Man, Yeah. It sounds super interesting from the outside. How long have you been there at Conan writing for Conan? I've been here since the, the TBS show started in 2010. So like seven and a half years. So you came right after the whole fallout with the Jay Leno situation and all that. Yeah. I I missed that. Thankfully. (laughs) Yeah. That I watched Conan's, uh, his documentary when he went around and toured the the country for the world, oh, I think. Yeah. What he did that for like a year. He was just hitting the road playing playing music and guitar and stand. It was a weird thing that he. It was pretty impressive how he was able to put that together. Is he is Conan naturally was he ever a true stand up? I no, he wasn't a stand up in the sense that he was you know hanging out at open mics and that kind of a thing. Um, so it's weird. It's almost like he got his you know m- most of his stage stage performances were on television, the first ones, which is so unusual when you think about it. I mean, I think about my first three years performing, I, I'm so grateful there's no videotape of it. And, you know, most of Conan's earlier performing experience was on national television, which is crazy. Um, and he's, he's such a natural, you know, and I didn't go on the the Conan Can't Stop tour, um, but I I've gone on other things with him where he's done live shows. You know, I, I mean his daily shows live also in front of an audience, but uh, just a stage show, and he's 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 amazing. He's great. Now I know you you wrote for a tough crowd with Colin Quinn, right? Yeah, that how was my was, first writing job. How was that? So I'm a big I. I I see a lot of Jim Norton stand up, and Jim talks about being on Tough Crowd all the time. And that yeah. crew of guys they had, what like, what can you write for them? They were all stand-ups in their own right. How were you trying to punch up their jokes? What are you doing? 
No, I mean, you look at like it's Norton, it's Nick DiPaolo, it's Patrice O'Neill, it's Greg Giraldo, Rich Voss, um, Keith Robinson. Those were the core regulars, and you can't write anything for those guys. Um, so we, the writers, the stuff we did was the um, the Act Three, which was the like the little thing they did between. They had two two acts of arguing <laughs> and trying to talk over Patrice, basically. <laughs> And then we'd have like a little sketch or something in act three. And then act four would be everyone doing kind of like one last joke. So that's what the writers did. We, we pitched act three ideas, but that was my first writing job. And it was so, uh, it, it was, it was crazy to be around all those, all those people. I can't believe it only went two seasons, but oh well. How did, <laughs> that, how do you, or I guess, how do you get a writing job? Was that always a goal? I know you, you did stand up first, correct? Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't a goal, and um, it it only became a goal after I heard about who got hired to write for Tough Crowd. I was like, wait a minute, I'm funnier than that guy. So not 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 that I'm naming names, but um, I it, sometimes it's weird. You think you can't do something until you someone else is doing it, and you're like, wait a second, I could if that guy could do it, I could do it. So that's how I I I started, you know, just sending stuff to Colin Quinn, and he eventually hired me to to write on it. Um, but um. Uh, yeah, it was a it was a crazy first job, and it, I, I guess I got the I, I wanted to write for it because I wanted to be in at the Comedy Cellar, which was is the club that sort of that where Tough Crowd was based on. It was based on the table at the Comedy Cellar where all the comics were just talking in between their spots, you know, shouting and <laughs> trying to convince each other of their political points of view. Yeah, that's why that show was so good. I, I still hear the comics talk about that table. It seems like th that table's kind of died down, hasn't it? Well, I, I haven't been there in a while. It's different now. It's just different now. I mean, literally two of the, the best people have died. <laughs> you know, Gerald, Greg Giraldo passed away um, and uh, Patrice O'Neill also died. So, you know, uh, you, you're right, right off the bat, you, you're missing two of the, the greatest voices that table ever had. Was that, in, was that an intimidating situation to walk into being your first writing gig and – those guys are all known to be super ruthless New York, like true comics. Yeah, it was. It was very intimidating. I had imposter syndrome till maybe a week ago. <laughs> what, is, what exactly does that mean? Just like, oh, I'm not good enough. They're going to find out that I suck <laughs> and they're going to find out that I'm a fake. You know, that that's a common feeling I think you have when you're surrounded by people that are so good. And it's weird. Like I'm the same age as a lot of those guys, but I came up in San Francisco, so I didn't I, I wasn't friends with them and I didn't really, they didn't know me that well and I didn't know them that well. And, and that sort of comedy was really different from how we, how we comics coming up in San Francisco started it. We weren't into that trashing each other thing. And I, it, even though I loved it, I was like, I wasn't good at it. I was like, what's happening? This is amazing. I want to be in it. I want to get good at this, but it wasn't, it wasn't my natural go-to as a comic. Is that a big difference between female and, and male comics? I know at least just, Females and males in general, like my wife, we talk about that. She, she's been around me long enough. And we've been married for a long time, and she knows how we are around my friends. But basically, if you're close with someone, you just mess with each other the whole time. And sometimes it can look mean from the outside. But my wife's like, man, if my friends and I interacted like you guys do, we wouldn't be friends. Like, there would be hurt feelings. People would hold it grudges. Is that a difference? Or are female comics more inclined to, to trash on each other? You know, I think it's a difference in style. I think with male comics, it's more it, you just take out an anvil and you hit somebody on the head till they're done. And women, female comics are more like shiv and it's, you know, tiny slices until you don't realize it till you're bleeding out and you're like, "Oh my god, I've been I've been cut 10,000 times." So, it might be a difference stylistically and um so definitely that New York scene was really dominated by that sort of more masculine style. And what's the what's the culture like at, at Conan now working? Has has it been the same since 2010, and how has that morphed with new people coming in? And now, obviously, we know what's going on in Hollywood. The Oscars just happened. The craziness with Harvey Weinstein has it changed in how like your workplace is? No, I mean my workplace isn't. Um, it's it's a fun workplace. It's not there. It, it isn't infected with any of that, uh, you know, harassment or anything like that. Um, and so I, I don't think, you know, for us, we, we just, it kind of changes how we joke about things. Um, I, I know like, you know, maybe a year and a half ago we were doing Bill Cosby jokes, 
But then it, it becomes one of these when, when you start reading about the stories about the women and you're like, Ugh, yeah. all right, this is really rape. It, then you can't really joke about it, which, you know, uh, it, uh, as a writer, I'm like, oh, all right. I, you know, it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it takes away some things you can joke about, um, which makes it a little bit tougher, you know? And it, so it's, it's more comedically, um, uh, we have to, we have to, we have more things to dance around, um, more sensibilities to dance around. So that makes it, makes it a little, a little tougher to write jokes. But, but for us, it's not, it's not, it's a pretty fun, it's a cool atmosphere. So it's, it, for me, I haven't been affected by that kind of yeah. thing. From any, anything I've seen watching clips of Conan and watching that documentary behind this, he got a lot of, he gave him a lot of access. That's what made that really good. You saw him. Yeah being tired in between shows, struggling, having little yeah. arguments with his assistant girl. I don't know. Does she work on the show? Sona. Yeah. She's still there. Yeah. Yeah. I love their, their back and forth is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it is. <laughs> no, he's, he, he, um, he has a very, he's a very Irish point of view, you know, and, and that you just, you show your love by, you know, trashing someone. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of the, he he does it equally for the male and the female writers and all everyone who works on the show. So we're sort of used to it and and we a lot of us are the same way so it's it's fine. It's you know, we understand that's how love is shown because we were raised that way as well. Is it weird sometimes now at least in the in the uh comedy clubs? I've listened to a lot of different comics male and female. I've heard females actually be frustrated be a lot of times a their male comics like I don't can I hug you now what can I do should I pat you on the back I'm scared I don't know how I don't want to get in trouble um yeah I mean most comics aren't hugging each other <laughs> <laughs> a good point that's a good point there, there is like the thing where you where someone's bringing you up on stage and you do you shake hands or do you hug so I don't know it's it's usually when you're up on stage, your adrenaline is so high, you're not really going for a big, you know, full chest hug. You're just like, get off stage. I got to tell my jokes. So, do you still get nervous going on stage? Not really. I mean, it depends if how, what the stakes are. If I'm doing a TV spot, I get nervous. Um, but uh, but it's like a good nervous. Usually, I'm pretty well prepared, so I'm, I just think I want to execute, you know, this. I have a series of jokes and I just want to make sure I tell them right. And I can adjust to the audience. If the audience sucks, I don't want it to show on my face. You know, those kind of things where you just want your performance to be, to be good. Cause you know, it's going to be preserved on camera for the rest of your life. So. Yeah, exactly. And you do a lot of uh, uh, stand up on Conan. How does that come about? Do you go to him and tell him, Hey, I, I got a good five minutes. I want to hit. <laughs> um, not really. I, I probably should be a little more aggressive, but it's, uh, every once in a while, I'll I'll have a set ready, and I'll and maybe I'll let the booker know, and if it works, we can we can do it. Can, but, do, you, um, do you tell them you're always there? Hey, if if someone backs out, someone le can't show up day of. I'm I'm always ready. Yeah, I'm I actually am always ready. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on a sm uh, five minute set now. I mean, I I the, I guess that's how I work on things. I because I I have a day job and I I mostly do short spots in Los Angeles or New York. I don't get to do a ton of road work. Um, I I work like short form if that makes sense. So I'm always kind of working on a five minute set versus you know uh, road comics that get to work on a new hour every year. I'm I've sort of do a micro version of that. Isn't that much harder? Harder. I've heard a lot of comics say that. Back in the day when it was such a big deal to go on Johnny Carson or Letterman and, and have a five or six minute little set that just kills them. A lot of guys, I feel like, say they struggled because they're used to being putting this full hour together and you need the whole kind of thing in context. And to try to narrow that down was difficult for them. I think putting together an hour is very difficult because I, I, I think, you know, as a comic, you you're not going to change so much year to year as a human being. So you're sort of going to have the same point of view on parenting or guns or whatever this year as you're going to have in two years. So to come up with a new a new way to say something that you've already said is is very very tough. Um, and sometimes I find people that keep doing an hour a year it gets a little repetitive where you're like this feels like the thing you did last year and, and maybe you could take more time off and really have other experiences so that you change more as a person and have something really new to say. And, you know, 
it's, it's, you always have to generate material, but you're still yourself. So it's really hard not to repeat yourself. That's, I think that once you become a good comic and you have your voice down, that's the new struggle of how do now, how do I stay fresh and original? You know, now that I've, I've established who I am, how do I, how do I do that in a new way with this joke? And that, that becomes a very different challenge. Yeah, it's a lot different than back in the day. Guys would go, they would tour the same hour for years and years, wouldn't they? And not yeah. even change. I know. I remember when I, I started, there's these, there would be these headliners that there was a guy who was famous, Denny Johnston, who had the same 45 minutes for about 20 years. And he never wrote it. Once he wrote the 45, he was done. And I'm like, in a way, I'm like, oh, that seems like heaven. You just show, you know, then you, you have all day to yourself. You don't have to write any new jokes. You just show up do your thing and then get out. I mean, it's, that's kind of like the old cat skills way to do stand up too. But now it's, you got to have new stuff every night and people come back to see you next year. They want new stuff. They want as much new stuff as possible. And it's, that's, it's really tough to get like for me, it takes, sometimes it could take years to actually perfect one joke, you know, and I'll be telling it it's a B plus joke, you know, for like two years. And then all of a sudden I'm like, Oh, and I re and I fix it and it's an A joke, you know, but that 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 process might take years, which is for a 30 second laugh, you know, for 30 seconds of a show. So it's, it's very challenging to turn over material that quickly it, at a high quality, you know. Does that process take place on stage or just sitting around thinking? Like, how does that process play out? It, it should for me, I should just do more sitting with premises, but I do that all day with for Conan that, that it's hard for to, to do that at night too. So it's often when I'm driving to a gig, <laughs> I do a lot of writing when I'm driving and when I'm waiting to go up on stage, if I, if I get, you know, if I, I'm up in 20 minutes, I open my notebook and I'm like, Oh, these dumb jokes again. Well, I'll try to very quickly scribble something down. And that's often how I get the start of a new joke. Um, and then listening to the jokes, like I record all my sets and if I listen to them, I, I hear, I can hear that, the problems and I can hear where there's space where I could tighten something up or come up with a laugh there, you know, but no one likes to listen to their own voice. It's very painful. Yeah. If you do, I feel like you're a full go sociopath. If you love your voice and you love everything you do. You're a horrible person. Honestly. I mean, you have to oh, nail that one. Got it. Boom. I don't <laughs> need to work on it. I always feel like, hey, because yeah, I, I do different like public speaking things and I do podcasts and I do a lot of different radio and you never feel like you've nailed it. I can't imagine if you do. And I've talked to some guys like, no, nah, I felt feel really, really good about what just happened. My three hours radio show. I feel, yep, pretty much nailed it all. I wouldn't change a thing. I'm like, man, you are crazy. If it, I don't know. I just can't, I can't put my head. I'm not, I don't have like self hatred or feel like I'm awful, but I definitely always know when I make mistakes and I want to change things regardless of what I'm doing. Oh yeah. I mean, and you're always, you, you in the general generic, all of us, we're always just making these dumb mistakes. You know, I mean, I catch myself all the time, you know, sometimes I'll tell a joke where I needed to, where the laugh is a callback to a previous joke. And I freaking forgot to tell the first joke. So I'm, <laughs> I'm like, Oh my God, I'm headed toward, I'm about to crash into a wall. Cause I'm calling back a joke. I haven't told and the audience is going to be like, what is she talking about? So, do you, do you whatever. just go with it then? If you find yourself that deep, you forgot the original, do you just kid continue? Yeah, I'll tell and I'll mug really hard and hopefully people will laugh anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, go, that one didn't make sense. But she really tried hard on that one. <laughs> did uh, <laughs> did coming up in San Francisco, does that like, uh, with comedy, it seems like it's so ingrained in where you came up. Like there's Boston guys, New York, LA, San Fran. Wasn't that like Robin Williams, uh, Steve Martin, weren't they from there? Or they started there? Steve Martin was more LA, but Rob Williams definitely. And he, he used to bartend at the club I started called, which is called the Holy City Zoo. Um, and it was just this little tiny dive in, um, on Clement Street in San Francisco. And, um, so it, it, it definitely, he sort of set the, the template of taking these weird chances. And so a lot, there's a lot of weirdos from San Francisco. And a lot of them you haven't, no one's heard of, but they influence the people that maybe were a little more mainstream. Um, and so that I think that when you, you know, there's so many San Francisco comics that are, that have their own voice. And I think it's because 
you're in, you, we were encouraged early on to just be strange on stage and not necessarily immediately go for a laugh versus I think like the Boston comics, they're so quick and it's because their audiences, it felt like it always seems like Boston comics are trying not to get stabbed by the audience. So they were just <laughs> telling joke after joke after joke as quickly as possible. And those guys would just hammer and murder on stage. And with San Francisco, the audiences were very, they were very patient and they would wait for you and they would, um, they would love the weird stuff. So, so in a way it, it didn't prepare you for the road because road audiences don't like weird stuff. They like meat and potatoes and that's it. Um, but it, it did teach you to go, you know, try to, try to, try to go to a weird place before you come to the center, I guess. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, I could see that having stuff not translating on the road. I, I doubt if you went to a comedy club in Dayton, Ohio, and you pulled out a notebook and you're reading, yeah. I'm, I'm guessing you're going to lose them within the first 30 seconds. Definitely. Hey, I used to work this club called Jokers in Dayton, Ohio. I, oh yeah, and, I grew up. Oh man. I grew up about ten minutes from Jokers. Yeah. Oh okay. Yeah. There's. It's very easy to lose the audience <laughs> with <the> at Jokers. <laughs> Did you ever work at uh, Wiley's Comedy Club? I didn't. I was loyal to Lisa Grigsby, and then um, I think the club went down. Or did it become a funny bone? I forget. Uh, there's a funny bone in Columbus. I don't know if there's a date in funny bone or not. Okay. But Jokers is not there anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It was that club was so funny because she also Lisa, the woman who owned it was total hustler. So she had comedy going on in the comedy room, obviously. And then um, when you would leave, there's a merch table where comics could sell their stuff. But she also sold vibrators. Really? So there, was like, there was like tons of sex toys. It was just like there's like five businesses going on in that comedy club. But I respected her hustle, man. She was making money. Yeah, I respect the hustle too. Yeah, I, <laughs> I I went to Wiley's a lot growing up. I knew Wiley who started the club, and oh, cool. he, he was good friend, a good family friend of one of my good buddies. So I, I got to see a lot of different people coming up. And one guy that stuck out, I remembered it as a, I was going as a kid, twelve, thirteen years old. No, uh, really? Oh, oh yeah, we, we would. They obviously there was no other kids there, and that was they could smoke in there and everything. It was fair game, oh, whatever okay. they wanted too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they, uh, I remember the guy from Police Academy who did all the sounds and noises. Oh, no, Michael no, Winslow. Michael, Michael Winslow. Yeah, is he still touring? I don't know. I I don't see him. I don't see him. But that doesn't mean he's not touring. I don't, I'm not sure. He was as a kid. Obviously, that was great for me. I thought it was hilarious. Yeah. All of his little yeah. uh, his shtick. But I saw Bobcat there as well. I, I've had uh, I've had like Tom Segura on here a couple times and Bert Kreischer and had them I had Tom's wife Christina. Are, are do you know Christina? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, she just Great. had a she had a Netflix special that came out I don't know six months ago maybe. Is that so? It, all of a sudden you put a Netflix special out or you put I know you have a special on CISO, which now did CISO switch to something else or what? CISO's down. I don't know where what's happening with my special right so now. So where is it? Of, yeah, how's it work? Where to it go? It's hidden. <laughs> It's buried. Do you own I it? Know. Well, I, I, I licensed it to CISO and they bought it for three years. And so they've had it a year and they went down. So I, I don't know, it might be buried for two more years. I'm not really sure. We're still trying to, myself and the people that produced it with me are still trying to uh, fry it from their hands if we can. Yeah, if it goes under, there should be something that you get it back. Hey, if, we're, if our company does not exist, I want my, my material. I agree. Although NBC owns CISO, so uh, maybe, you know, they're, I, I'm not really sure. I should find out what's happening with that. I sort of just gave up. Well, <laughs> and, and I decided to write a book on death instead. So, yeah. <laughs> Dead people suck. When did that? That just came out a couple months ago, right? It came out a couple weeks ago. It came out oh. February 13th. And it's sort of like comedic essays about, it was about my dad dying of cancer in hospice. And so it's about hospice, cancer, grief, funerals, you know, the aftermath of somebody, you know, when you lose your parent when they're old. It's it's for people that um, are kind of middle, like maybe 30s and up that have lost a parent because it's such a, a weird kind of death where like you know what's happening and they're elderly, but you're still completely shocked and unprepared when it happens. So it's, it's a book about all that kind of stuff. Did that, did that, uh, the idea of writing that come about when you started like live tweeting his whole progress when I know when he was sick, you, you, you got a lot of traction for tweeting about taking pictures with him and being very funny with it. 
Yeah, it, it, I didn't think of writing a book at the time. I was just sort of trying to get through whatever was happening. I, you know, even when he was admitted into hospice, I, I, I had, I was like, well, he's gonna beat it. You know, he'll be that guy that gets out of hospice, which never happens. I mean, it happens one in a million times. But you, you want your dad to be the one in a million. Um, so then after he passed away, I sort of, I did a comedy special about it, which is the CISA one. And then, um, I decided to write a book because, uh, there's a, the jokes I wrote for my special or, you know, stand up. it's, it's gotta be something that the joke's gotta survive, you know, like it's gotta be a Friday night late show, you know, it's gotta survive the audience being drunk and the waitress interrupting them and, uh, you know, trying to get drink orders and passing out the checks. So jokes have to be sort of a little blunt. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to write some stuff that was a little more subtly funny and that was more funny on paper. So that's, that's the difference between the special and the book. Now, both of your books are New York times bestsellers, right? The first one is the second one just came out. So I don't know if it is yet, but the first one's called shitty mom and it's just a parenting book. It's like a funny parenting book. And, uh, yeah, so maybe I, I hope dead people suck. The New York Times gave it a good review, but I, yeah. I, that doesn't mean it'll be a bestseller. I it, hope so. It's gotten great reviews. and it, Well, what's smart is, at least on the cover of your new book, Dead People Suck, it says New York Times best selling author, maybe. It says something yeah, on, there, on the cover. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah I, so of course. Of, that's the book. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, I hope, I hope it sells okay. It, it's a different topic for sure. Parenting, a lot more people want to buy books on, I think. You know, when you're talking about death, people are like, oh, is this too, is it, you know, it's very dark humor. And some people are like, oh, that might be, I'm, you know, the person I would get it for it might be too sensitive. So it's maybe a little dicier purchase. I don't know. No, especially now people, people get it. Is there anything that you feel like is off limits that you wouldn't joke about? No, I mean, there's always a way to joke about something. It's, you just have to find your point of view. You know, I, I, I. I don't think anything's off limits. Um, you know, to me, the best jokes are when something something bad happens to you personally and you find a way to make it funny. Those are, to me, the, the like the well-earned jokes. But then, I don't know, I also like just those brutally mean, unnecessarily mean roast jokes. Those are also <laughs> where people are like, oh, you're punching down. But I, I, sometimes I really appreciate a, a just a, a violent, mean punch down joke as well. <laughs> Do you ever write for those roasts? Um, I haven't written for a roast. I, I, I actually did. Um, I performed on the Jim Norton roast, <laughs> um, which was like one of the highlights of my life at Caroline's in 2005, I think. Um, and that was, that was really fun. It was, uh, it was terrifying though, but that, that would, that would have been like the peak of my New York comic career was performing on, on Norton's roast. Yeah, and you wrote a real good piece in the in the New York Times uh, about uh, Louis C.K. Where did you like? How much interaction did you have with Louis? Oh, not not much, and I never had a negative experience with him. And they, the, I, I kind of was trying to write more about what it's like to be female comic, you know, versus being a male comic in terms of getting stage time and getting work, um, and how how like, you know, if you're um, a woman, there's certain situations where you're like, I don't want to go to that club because there's a guy there that I'm not comfortable around. And so you always, you kind of take yourself out of that situation. And that might have, might have been a time where that gets you more work. And so it, it, so there's a lot of times where female comics pull themselves out because of a, you know, working at a certain club or going to a certain place, you know, like a networking situation, because you don't want to be in an unsafe situation. And that actually costs you a lot of income and lots of opportunities, um, which, and I, I don't exactly have a fix for it yet, ex except for hiring more female comics. But I just kind of wanted to write about like, that's a different repercussion um, of, you know, sexism or whatever. It was a good piece. You, you talked about how on stage, everything is fine. And then, but the, se the second you get off stage, it can be very, you can be put in some very uncomfortable situations and you, you illustrated it well. And I'm thinking, man, I, I get it. I understand it would be, it would be very uncomfortable to just to deal with creeps that own certain clubs or creeps that work there yeah. or shade running shady deal. You know, there's plenty of shady people in the business. I, oh, I guess yeah. the only thing I can think, I'm like, man, could you, can't you bring somebody with you that helps out like a security? But then I'm thinking it's a bunch of money to be bringing someone around with you. Well, 
Yeah, no one does that for free. Yeah, it is a weird sensation to be on stage and just be killing. I mean, killing and the and and you are a dominant force on stage and then you get off stage and you know, the club owner's putting his arm around you <laughs> and kind of dropping it down and you're like, you know, I want to get paid. I need to get paid for this gig, but I would like to punch this guy in the face, you know? And so I guess women, when women have to avoid those situations, then, then they miss out on, on work, you know? It do. It's a weird time. I think things are changing now, hopefully for the better, at least for female comics. So you yeah. don't have to miss out on certain gigs like that, but man, it's still a weird, you're in a weird situation. <laughs> you really are. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it, I'm so used to it. Like my friend Jackie Cation, we have a podcast and we talk about this all the time. We're so used to that behavior and used to maneuvering around it that it's so interesting that the new generation of female comics are like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, good for you. And and I guess I got so used to it that I, I just thought that's the way it is. you know. And, and now because there's so many more women doing comedy, y you can – you can, there's almost like enough of a pushback where it wouldn't hurt you as much to call somebody out on it. Like if I had called anyone out on that stuff in my twenties, I would never have worked in the Midwest. <laughs> you know, there's like one guy who books 16 clubs and if you don't, you know, just figure out a way to get around his touching, you're not going to work, you know? And now I guess it's, it's just a different time with social media and stuff where you can out a club owner and he would have to change. It wouldn't come down on you. He would have to be like, I'm sorry, I won't do that again. And that, that dynamic never existed uh, when I was starting. So it's, it's cool to see. Have you ever had a, anyone that was a creep back in the day? Have you had any of those guys apologize to you? No, they don't think they did any, anything wrong. <laughs> well, I think they're paying you. I'm doing you a favor. I'm paying you yeah, to come in here. Yeah, I'm just hugging you. I'm just, Oh, you know, I mean, they really, I mean, I don't think they're, they think that way, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's nice to have a brain that excuses you from all those things. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's very true. Uh, <laughs> switching over to the, back to Conan for a second. I, I watched recently, my buddy sent me one of the little sketches that Conan did when he went to the American girl store. Oh and, my God. <laughs> which was, I know, I know a lot of people love that. It was very funny and yeah. sure took plenty of time to film. Those things when he it seems like he's ad lib and thinking right on, on the spot, going back and forth with waiters and different people working there. Is that is that something that you guys write for? Does he come up with that before, like, or is that just all off the top of his head? That's mostly him. I think sometimes um, who, whoever's the writer who pitched it will go with him. They'll, you know, if, if something happens on the spot, they'll suggest some ideas, you know. And sometimes in a situation like that, you get you get to the remote location. It's called like a remote. And all of a sudden you realize, oh, that waiter is perfect. They're not overacting. They're not hamming it up too much so we can work with them. And it's, it's a, a lot of that stuff is finding, you know, little things you weren't expecting that work out great uh, on the fly. But Conan's so, he's so smart and so fast that, you know, by the time you thought of your, you know, B plus riff, he's got an A plus riff already locked and loaded. So. Uh, what about, um, going like touching on all like getting political? That's the whole thing now with late night. You say you're going to write, write jokes for stuff going on with, um, the whole Trump administration. I know the one guy, this, he had to be just feeding you guys gold. What's his name? Just recently went on drunk on CNN and called the Sam one. Denver. Yeah. Didn't he call Sarah Huckabee Sanders a fat slob? <laughs> this guy is just stepping all over himself. <laughs> How, how do you how do you guys go about I guess navigating what how political you can get? Well, it's you know I think it's show by show. Like our show isn't super political, and and I don't think our audience is hyper interested in politics. Um, like I watched Colbert the other night because they 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 taped right as the Sam Numbers thing was happening, and so they kind of changed their monologue really quickly, and they they did a very like a forensic breakdown on who he was with jokes and stuff, which was great. Um, but that's not our show at all. Like we, you know, we did some jokes. We, I think we did one joke last night, which is the day after and just about him very quickly. But it, our, our, our audience is more into silly stuff. And I think we also feel like so many late night shows are 
are sort of, you know, a little lean a little bit on the strident side, which, you know, um, attracts a certain kind of audience. And our audience isn't would kind of like rather forget about politics by the time they watch our show that night. Mm -hmm. You know, you're either all in on politics or you're like, oh, enough. And I think our audience is more that I've had enough. Please just be silly tonight. Um, And so that's kind of that's kind of where we come from. So our our I think our political jokes aren't, you know, you don't have to know the names of everyone in the administration to get our political jokes. <laughs> well, it's, it's so it's it's so true with it's a show by show basis. So Colbert, he has ri- risen to number one by being 100 yeah. percent political and just annihilating yeah. Trump every night. Yeah. And, and be- same with John Oliver, too. Yeah, they yeah. really get into detail. And it's, you know, it's great. Um, but that, that's not Conan's personality. It never has been. I mean, since he started, he was always, um, he always, always enjoyed just being silly and ridiculous, you know. So we just try to go with his personality in terms of joke writing. So it's not too stride in and it's not you know we want our jokes to get a laugh and not a woo. Yeah. You know? Yeah, there's like, a there's, there's, difference. Isn't that a difference? Yeah. I think yeah. that's that's a huge difference. It's almost like now, regardless of how you feel about Trump, it's almost like pandering to the crowd when you you're getting you're you're not getting laughs. You're getting a bunch of like standing ovations for no comments. Yeah. Like, I don't. Yeah. It's just I don't. That's not really comedy to me. No, and it to me sometimes when I watch some stuff like that, it riles me up as opposed to relaxes me. You know, yeah. like if I just look at it as an audience member, I just. If I'm coming to a comedy show, I just want to laugh. I don't want to leave angrier. <laughs> you know, so, so yeah, it's, it's, but it's every night it's a joke by joke basis. Like, you know, how, do, do we want to go this way or that way? And uh, I think every, every show has their own voice and some people want to get riled up and, you know, finish comedy, like half laughing and half like, Oh, I'm going to call my Senator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fine it was- too. You, you, you want different things, different nights, maybe you know. Yeah, whatever. I mean, funny is funny. I don't. It doesn't matter yeah. how you go about it. If you get people to laugh, then yeah, more power to you. But it's yeah. weird. Colbert goes from taking the gig, and they're saying he's going to be replaced by James Corden, who's going to jump spots with him. To now, he's number one, and it's yeah, it's, oh, yeah. it's off the the heels of just bashing the whole administration. Well, he's so ta- He's so talented. Like he's great. Yeah, he's great at what he does. Yeah. And, you know, he, he definitely takes a point of view, but they're great jokes, you know? So, I, I mean, they're great jokes. He just, he, he and his team come up with great jokes from his point of view. And yeah. that's, that's their job. That's their gig, you know? He's a, a really weirdly smart guy, too, to where yeah. he can get yeah, away. Because really. he's not playing a character anymore. And I, I listened to his interview on Howard Stern. He talked about how I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm presented now for the first time when I have this late night show I've never been on camera not in character. Like I was playing a character uh, for all these years, and now this is me. Like I got to figure out what I'm doing. Yeah, which yeah. just um, I well, had to be I, I, intimidating. Definitely, I think I think maybe it took him a a little while, which is totally natural. You know, it's a little it's a it's a different way to pr- perform in front of the camera, and but he's killing it. You know, he's crushing now, so it worked. Yeah, so. I'm going to wrap this thing up, but what's uh, like, what's the, the future look? Do you want to ultimately stay with Conan for as long as he makes a run and then continue to do all of your stand up and side projects? Yeah. I mean, I'll stay at Conan as long as he'll have me. It's for me, I'm a single mother and I have an 11 year old son and I live, you know, really close to the studio. It's really, where do you it, film uh, in Burbank? Okay. Um, and, um, and so, it allows me to raise my son and I can still do stand up at night. I still go to New York frequently on the weekends and stuff. So I, I'm able to kind of do everything, um, you know, that I want to do. So I'm, I'm so grateful to be able to work with Conan and I hope I can keep staying here as long as he's on the air. That's awesome. Well, good luck with the, uh, the new book, dead people suck. I'm sure it will be a New York times bestseller here shortly. And it would have, are you going to write any new, any books in the future? Any ideas? Right now. I'm so excited to wake up and not have to write a book. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, because I just spent, I would do it a lot really early in the morning because that's the only time I have alone. Yeah. And um, I, I, I wake up and I'm like, ah, oh, I can just have coffee and look at a bird. I don't have to write. So I think I'm going to take a little breather and just write jokes for Conan and myself. <laughs> well, good for you. I know writing a book is a huge undertaking. My dad 
wrote a book called Get Real Selling on like sales and, and different things in the oh, wow. his industry. And he he said he wrote it. And then the publisher guy said, okay, well, what's your, what's the next one going to be? And he was like, are you kidding me? I've spent, <laughs> I've spent two years. I've dumped everything I know. Every, my whole brain is empty now. I put it all into this. And the book is like 120 pages, not even long. Dude, I totally understand. Like, I wanted to write a piece for the New York Times about grief to kind of help sell this book. But I'm like, I don't have anything left. <laughs> I've said everything. It's all in the book. And I'd just be rewriting what I already wrote, you know? Yeah, you emptied it all out. I, yeah, that's a cool thing. So yeah, I'm look uh, good luck with that. I'm looking forward to it, and hopefully we'll uh, we'll talk to you down the road and be checking out all of uh, Conan's monologues and, and see where your little your jokes are scattered in. <laughs> see if you can guess. Cool. Thanks yes. so much, AJ. All right. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye. We're glad you could join us for today's conversation. After you subscribe to the show, head over to thehawkcast.com or reach out to AJ directly on Twitter at officialAJHawk to recommend future guests that will help us inspire people to keep talking. Thanks again, and we look forward to speaking with you next time on The Hawkcast.